My name is Virginia Halsiger. I'm from ABC TV News here in Canberra. And it's my great pleasure to be your MC and host today. The question, the big question today is, where is Asia headed? What's Asia's future role in the world? And how will what's going on in Asia affect our lives here in Australia, around the region and around the globe? We have been joined today to answer these big questions by an expert panel from the College of Asia and the Pacific at the ANU. Andrew McIntyre is Dean of the College and a specialist on Indonesia and Southeast Asian Affairs. Veronica Taylor is Director of the School of Regulation, Justice and Diplomacy in the College and an expert on law and society in Asia. Stephen Howes is Head of the Economics Program here at the Crawford School at the ANU and he's a specialist on India and has just completed the recently, re recently released review of Australia's aid program. And Cathy Morton is a China specialist in international relations and associate dean of research in the college. Welcome to you all. <laughs> the first to our panel, I think it's fair to say that we're all very conscious of Asia's growing economic importance in the world, especially here in Australia, where three quarters of our trade and the largest part of our investment comes from Asia. But what does the emergence of Asia's economic power mean more generally for the world from where you sit, Andrew? Uh, Virginia, the economic transformation that we've been uh, seeing roll out across what we've called the developing world for a long time, but especially uh, here in Asia, uh, is having really quite profound flow-on effects. Some people are calling this uh, uh, the beginning of the post-Western world. Uh, one of our most venerable colleagues here at the ANU, Coral Bell, more evocatively calls it the end of the Vasco da Gama era. Um, but uh, however you want to style it, the general point is the uh, global players that have been the dominant players for a long time, the United States, the big European countries, Japan, will not be as dominant as they have in the past. In this part of the world, in Asia, it's largely a region-wide story. Um, decade after decade of sustained uh, rapid economic growth just has huge flow-on effects. Uh, a lot of attention has been given to China. It's the most, uh, the most dramatic changes in China. As we all know, Within 10 years, China's projected to become the largest economy in the world. A lot of attention has been focused on the uh, flow-on effects for this, for the military mm. balance of power, uh, particularly between the United States and China. But this is bigger and broader than that. This, this affects all sorts of social, political and environmental dimensions. And they're precisely some of the things that I hope we can touch on today, and I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about China. But I just want to come over to you now, Stephen, uh, and have a, 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 a think about the economics. Or let's think about for a moment the economics of this. When we talk about the rise of Asia, India, China, is it all about opportunities and is it all good news or are there risks? Uh, well, I think it's both. And I think, first of all, you know, it is a story of uh, opportunities and, you know, primarily, first and foremost, uh, opportunities for the people living in Asia. So their lives have been transformed in the uh, 20 years ago, say 1990, you know, more than half of the people living in East Asia, living in South Asia, live below, you know, what is the international poverty line, a dollar a day. You know, today in uh, East Asia, it's less than 10%. Uh, South Asia is followed behind, but it's still, it's less than half of what it was. So hundreds of millions of people's lives have been uh, transformed and they've been taken out of poverty. I mean, that, I think, is, is the, the, the most important uh, consequence of this. Uh, the, the other huge consequence, as Andrew's mentioned, these are rising economic superpowers. Um, and uh, with China, the second largest economy, uh, India's in the top 10 and they're, they're going to keep growing. Uh, there are risks, uh, as you uh, uh, as you suggested, uh, we, we can all see the, the short-term risks uh, in the Chinese economy uh, where they're struggling with high inflation. The global economic imbalances that caused the financial crisis haven't been resolved yet, and China continues to accumulate foreign exchange reserves. But I think more importantly than those short-term risks, there are long-term risks we need to worry about. Uh, China is, uh, has an aging population. 
uh, its population in a couple of decades is actually going to start uh, shrinking. Uh, and also China is yet to make the transition to uh, democracy. And that, of course, raises a lot of uh, questions. I think India, uh, in some ways, has brighter long-term prospects. It, it, it's already a stable democracy. It doesn't have the demographic problems that China has. But uh, you know, India also faces uncertainties. Uh, it's, it's next to a very unstable country. Pakistan, and we just saw the latest Mumbai <laughs> bombings. But India also has an insurgency on the other side of the country, you know, down the east side that we rarely hear of, but it's a sort of homegrown, uh, extreme left-wing insurgency. So India is also an unstable place. So definitely there are there there are risks. We we can't uh, predict the future, but given the track record so far, you'd have to expect uh, continued uh, growth. Okay, well, and those risks are terribly important to discuss, and we'll come back to that. But, Cathy, I want to come to you now. As a, a, an expert in China, how, how do we handle the foreign policy implications? I think China's rise um, focuses attention on two major critical dynamics. The first is obviously it's leading to greater prosperity across the globe. That's having rippling effects. But it's happening at the same time as the world is struggling to provide food, water, and energy to an expanding population that's increasingly urbanized. So this resource scarcity dilemma impacts China's modernization drive. It's also driving China's global footprint across the globe. And it's very much at the heart of some of the major foreign policy issues that we're dealing with from geopolitical rivalry food and energy security, and, and climate change. The second critical dilemma, picking up on, on points already made by, by Andrew and Stephen, is that China's really at the vanguard of this redistribution of power in the international system. And while on the one hand that's leading to a fair representation of the voices of emerging powers such as China, uh, India and, and Brazil, etc. It's also leading to a lot of uncertainty over international leadership. Who's going to lead the world? What's it going to look like? And how is that going to affect the pre-existing liberal rule-based order that we've come to know and, and rely upon? And these are exactly the sort of things that I think make a lot of people very nervous Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Veronica, yeah. I want to throw it over to you. In, in a, a, a social um, sense, th this rise globally, what effect does it have on us uh, as a society, our lifestyles, our institutions? So one of the, the really visible changes uh, for us, uh, both here in Australia but more broadly, is the fact that we're now deeply integrated with Asia. Uh, there's an immediate impact from uh, legal and regulatory changes in Asia. And we saw that recently in uh, discussion about beef in, uh, exports to Indonesia. Uh, what is really quite uh, important is that Asia is a very varied place. We have uh, wealthy Singapore, middle income China, low income Cambodia. And the governance and regulatory capacity of those countries is very, very different and uh, they impact uh, us differently and in unexpected ways. The big change here is the rise of China as a rule maker. So China has a powerful vote within the World Bank. It's an assertive <coughs> foreign investor. It's quite likely that at some point China's foreign assistance uh, to regions like Africa, which is currently in the form of hard infrastructure, like sports stadiums and, and bridges, is going to morph into rule making assistance for legislative change. And that will dramatically change the world that we live in because we currently visualise uh, the regulatory and legal divisions in the world as being the United States, Europe mm -hmm. and Japan. That's about to change and we therefore need to really monitor and engage quite closely uh, with both the rise of China and the impact that it's going to have within the region. Okay. With that overview, I just want to come back to <coughs> growth, um, to, to concentrate on that just for a moment. Um, I guess I, I must have been, I myself have made a lot of assumptions that this growth is going to continue and continue. Um, but Stephen, as an economist, is that the case? Uh, we, we look at, at China and India as being such enormous populations with a huge appetite for resources at the moment. But is this, can we just assume this growth is going to continue? Or are you anticipating a slowdown? Uh, you can't uh, assume it will continue, but that is, and there, there, there will be some slowdown in China. But uh, the most likely outcome 
is that it will continue. And I think the, uh, the key reason for this, and this is something that's often forgotten, is, is that these are still poor countries. So I mean, I said at the start, they're much less poorer than they used to be, but they are still poor countries. I mean, the per capita income of China is now not much more than one-tenth of what it is in the US or here. And India is then half again, uh, as only half as rich as, uh, as, rich as China. Uh, and, and just to put that in more concrete terms, because those are sort of abstract statistics, or I think that, that they tell a story. Um, if you think of China, you know, a very advanced country, no doubt has a booming middle class, but how do they cook their food in China? You know, well, more than half the people don't use electricity, don't use gas. They're still using wood, charcoal, or coal, traditional fuels. And if you look at India, India is much poorer than China. More than half the children in India are underweight because, of, because they're, they're malnourished. Right? So these are still countries that have a long way to go on the development trajectory. They're still confronting problems that we solved a long time ago. And that has two consequences. I think one is that they've got a lot of potential to keep growing. Right? That's the good side. But you know, what's different is that we're used to having the richest countries uh, as the most powerful countries. Right? But what we're seeing now are these emerging superpowers that are, that are still poor countries. And that means they're going to have very different priorities and play very differently in the international sphere, I think. It's an interesting way of putting it, because when you look at the growth rates with China <coughs> and India, um, both over 10, I think we're looking at 10.3 uh, for China and 10.4 for India, so much higher than Australia's growth, you know, down at uh, 2.7. It's an interesting way to say, but nevertheless, they're poor countries. They are still poor, and even in 2020, when China becomes, or we expect to become the biggest economy, they'll still be, it'll still be a poor uh, economy. You know, its income might be about a quarter of that, of that in the US. So yes, these countries are progressing. Uh, they do have a, a booming and very large middle class, but uh, we shouldn't think of them as developed economies. I, I want to ask you too about India. The um, issues that have arisen recently about governance and certainly corruption, do you see that as being a major obstacle to, to further growth and progress? Uh, that's a very difficult question. I mean, I think the strength of India is this very robust democracy. You know, it's a democracy that works. There's no threat, fundamental threat to India's democracy, and that gives it an enormous uh, stability. Uh, it has this uh, corruption. It somehow managed, despite all this corruption, to grow at, uh, you know, to increase growth to 6% uh, in, in the 90s and then 8%, and, and now it can get towards 10%. Uh, it seems to me it can, it is, it is a risk, but the biggest uh, problem with the governance problems in India is on more on service delivery, uh, on translating that growth into benefits uh, for the poor, in, in getting education, in getting health, in setting up a safety net. So it's certainly a constraint uh, on the country's development, but I don't see it, uh, and experience doesn't suggest that it's actually a fundamental constraint on growth. The system, the very strong dynamic private sector in India, has uh, worked it, worked a way around those problems. And there is also, I think, a dynamic. As you get a growing middle class, they put more pressure on the government. And you can see some areas of government that have definitely become uh, more responsive you know, rather than less. My question is, given the shallowness of Australia's relationship with China, which has traditionally revolved around cricket, Commonwealth and curries, and perhaps more recently commodities, just interested to know um, perhaps what aspects of trade are underdeveloped between the two countries? But did you say China, but you, you meant India, India, I think, didn't you? Yes, sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> underdeveloped trade. So what's underdeveloped so, as trade opportunities? So those of us sitting in the, uh, in the uh, university sector see uh, all sorts of potential for movement in both directions um, uh, in, the, in the education and the uh, science <laughs> and technology field. Um, uh, governments on both sides uh, are keen to get uh, uh, movement in science and technology and movement in uh, students and research collaboration going. Um, uh, uh, more controversial uh, is, of course, uranium. Uh, India's got a big interest in uh, uranium. Uh, less controversial uh, and often overlooked uh, is what Australia can be doing in the food space uh, in, in all sorts of ways. As India's middle class gets larger and larger, uh, there's going to be an interest in all, not just uh, rocks and minerals from Australia, mm -hmm. but uh, food-related products, uh, the technologies, the services, the processes that go around that. There's all sorts of things that Australia can be connecting with India on. Okay. Just add, yes, please. It's just that, I mean, I think it's a little bit outdated to, to think, you know, we're just on the, the curry and the cricket. I mean, Australia's trade with India is booming, and uh, it's gone up. It's, we're now, India's now the seventh largest 
trading partner, it's um, I think increased fivefold in the last 10 years. So we have a rapidly uh, expanding trade relationship with India. I think the problem with India is that um, you know we've left our run with India too late. We haven't taken India seriously. I know when I came back after living in India for six years to Australia, 2005, tried to get people more interested in India. The feeling was that's uh, not a priority. Relationship with India comes and goes. Uh, they're well, too bureaucratic, they're too socialist. And when, so, but when you say we've left it too late, do you think we're not making up for lost time We are, now? we're trying to now, but we're a latecomer. And whereas with China, you know, China we recognised in 1973, I think we were one of the first or the first country to recognise China, so we've always been, a, we've had that first mover advantage. Now we're trying to court India, but of course now everyone's trying to court India. So we're, we're in the queue. Did you want to answer that, Andrew? Yeah, I, 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 I think Australians don't uh, realise just... Um, how far back in the queue we are in India's estimation. Uh, I remember when I was a student here 25 years ago, uh, one of my close friends uh, was from India, and I visited with him uh, uh, a few years ago in uh, Delhi. He's a senior diplomat these days. And um, he was trying to be nice to me, but his basic message was, Andrew, you know, we don't have time to think about Australia. Dear, dear. And Richard, I thought you were deliberately being provocative when you said the shallowness of Australia's relationship with India, but uh, it would appear that that, that is, a, is a very fair comment. Um, I just want to move uh, on to the issue of commodities. Again, when we're talking about growth, um, this is something that has been very pertinent to Australia during our discussion about the uh, mining tax. Um, of course, we talk a lot about iron ore being the core, and uh, we know that... Um, Australia has shipped 260-odd million tonnes of iron ore to Chinese steel mills uh, alone, and uh, that our, our export there has skyrocketed over the last 10 years from around $5 billion to $61 billion, which raises the question, and I'd like to bring um, from our audience Andy Kennedy uh, in here, it raises the question, is there enough of this commodity resource to go around or is there a possibility that a, uh, a lack of the resource might cause conflict? I, I, I'm, I think this is a very interesting question and, and I'd, I'd sort of like to open it to the panel. The extent to which um, uh, competition for iron ore between uh, different Asian countries and, and competition over energy resources more generally uh, between different uh, Asian countries is, um, is something that worries you about the future of Asia uh, or not. Does it worry you as, <laughs> as an expert in this area? I think I'm less, uh, less worried about iron ore than I am about um, energy resources uh, more generally. Um, and, and that's because energy resources, um, in some cases at least, uh, are tied up with territorial disputes uh, like we see in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And that makes it very difficult to exploit those resources uh, and, and really resolve a, a sort of a distribution of those resources over time. So that's, that's something I worry about a little bit. And uh, we'll see what happens. I'd like to throw that open to the panel. And of course, you've raised that important issue of the South China Sea, which again uh, raises the issue of the tensions with the USA as well. Throw, I'd like to throw that uh, open to the panel. Who'd like to pick up on that? Veronica. Somewhere where we see this uh, happening uh, somewhat by stealth is Central Asia. There's a very quiet but very intense competition going on between China, Japan and Korea to secure energy resources in Central Asia. But it's being um, uh, followed through uh, multiple uh, tools including aid policy, scholarships, diplomatic overtures and cultural exchanges, but the Silk Road policy of each country is clearly directed towards energy security. What interests me about that is the way in which Central Asia is very, very peripheral to the Australian view of Asia. We haven't really invested in expertise. We're not putting a lot of um, human resources into deep study of Central Asia or about the relationships and competitions that are going on in that part uh, of the world. A similar argument could be made about uh, parts of South Asia. Mm. Can I ask you, do you think that we're not putting in those resources of those efforts because Australia until now has not understood that? Or has in, that been a choice? It's, it's a combination of factors. Um, in part, uh, it's uh, geographic distance. In part, it's uh, an effect of having invested very heavily in the places that were important to us as trade partners and were more proximate to us. 
In part, it's uh, about uh, coming to only a very recent understanding about the importance of the Islamic world mm. and uh, the importance of diversifying beyond Northeast Asia and the Pacific, our immediate neighbourhoods. Uh, and in part, it's just being a little bit slow on the take-up. Mm. It also goes back to the point about India. I mean, to be honest, you know, when we... We're the College of the Asia and Pacific, but, I mean, we have really been the College of East Asia and the Pacific. And when Australia has said Asia, it's really meant East Asia. I think it's only really in the last few years that we've started to look beyond East Asia, you know, to, to the South Asian subcontinent, and to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, one of us talking about going further west again. And, and Australia's not alone in this. Um, when lots of countries uh, in East Asia talk about Asia, they mean East Asia mm -hmm. too. And it goes to the patterns of economic interconnection that have grown up over the last uh, half century, and we're all starting to look beyond that now. Are we also suffering a little bit too from the fact that Australia has been so connected to the US uh, and the alliance there has been so much our focus that we have uh, failed to engage our own region because we didn't feel or haven't felt for a long time that we've needed to? Uh, uh, partly. Um, I think uh, Australia has long been active engaging, as Stephen said, uh, to our north. Uh, that's long been a, a core focus for us. Uh, and that's been um, uh, regardless of, mm -hmm. of uh, geography demands that we do that. Um, uh, I think it's true that historically we engage less with India in part because of our alliance relationships. If you go back to the character of the world during the Cold mm -hmm. War era, India was not part of uh, the world that we focused on. But, but it wasn't just because of that. There were also these economic factors. It was trade that was making us look north. There weren't the economic links that were making us look west. Mm. I think it's also a question of, you know, we, we're rethinking region at the moment, um, in, in part because of the growing complexity of, of trade patterns and energy resources um, and the routes across the Indian Ocean, etc. And um, if you're, for example, sitting in Beijing and you're thinking of region, you're not just thinking maritime Asia, you're thinking continental Asia and the Indo-Pacific because you're sitting there surrounded by 14 borders. Um, so you do tend to think of, of Central Asia. In fact, they do very much think about Central Asia, as we know. So in a sense, there's a naturalness to us sitting here in Australia and looking up to the maritime Asia rather than the, the border landmass. Mm. I think that's not be too negative. I, mean, I think Australia has played a useful bridging role you know, between the East and the West. You know, mm -hmm. We are part of the Western Alliance, part of the Alliance with the US, but we are in Asia or next to Asia. And uh, we have been an advocate of uh, Asian interests in uh, global fora, you know, through promoting APEC, through promoting the G20, through promoting uh, more influence for uh, Asia in the World Bank and the IMF. So I think we have been a, a good, uh, you, very played a useful role. I'm going to jump forward here, but do you feel, Stephen, that we still have a significant major role to play there, or have we been uh, overtaken? No, I think no. We're because you know, our economy is booming, and our, our our resources because of this energy insecurity. You know, our resources are in such high demand. Uh, our influence is going up, I think, rather than rather than down. And, and this rise of Asia is the key issue the world's facing, and, and we're a key part of that. So, no, I think. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and uh, we've invested in the G20. And, and you know, the question now is how effective is the G20 going to be, and how, how can we help that? I, I, build, building on that, I, mean, I think uh, Australia is one of several countries in this part of the world that's got great potential uh, to help uh, shape things. I mean, you leave aside the really big players, the United <coughs> States, China, um, and then you look at the rest. I mean, who, who is it that has the most impact shaping things. Um, uh, but are we exploiting our advantage there? Well, I, I would say <laughs> I, if, if what we're focusing on is our ability to shape the way the region engages with itself, I would say there's a range of countries, um, uh, and Australia is one of them. Um, Singapore is another. Uh, Indonesia is another. Korea is one, South Korea. Uh, uh, even Vietnam these days. Uh, countries that aren't large enough to threaten anybody else, but they're They've, they've got ideas, they've got diplomatic capital, and they're energetically out there pushing ideas. And I think that makes a difference. Shira, are you working on trade and politics? Now, do you think that all this trade and economic growth is, do you believe it's good for political stability? Or are you 
erring towards a, a concern that it, it could cause conflict? Well, there are cases where trade, increased trade and investment uh, causes conflict. Um, and there are cases where the, the conflict actually you know, reduces trade so much, like the India-Pakistan case. Um, it severely, severely hampers trade. Uh, but the Japan-China case is a, an interesting example where the trade actually uh, reduces conflict. Um, the trade constrains the bad politics. And that's importantly because uh, both Japan and China are committed to an open multilateral global system with um, rules and norms that constrain everyone. And that's, that's the case for East Asia more broadly. Um, they're all very open and committed to uh, the international trading system and importantly the World Trade Organization. And so one worry I would have and I think many would have is um, a weakening of that multilateral system, uh, say a collapse of the Doha round and what that does for the regional economy uh, but not just for the regional economy, for uh, political stability in the region as well. Okay, terrific. Um, we haven't actually really touched on yet the US and China, unless there's something I'd like to throw open to the panel because I think it's terribly important. I'm interested to hear you say that the trade can you know, weaken the potential for conflict because of the importance of trade. When we think of US, the US and China, is that where we're heading or not? Well, I think with the US and China relationship, it, it is constantly evolving. It's, it's not fixed, and uh, it has both competition and, and cooperation, cooperation characteristics. What's, clear, what, what's unclear is the direction in, in, in which it's moving, and that's causing a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, I think, at the moment, um, and leading to big debates here in Australia of whether we have to actually choose between a source of security and a source of prosperity. Um, in, and the, in my view, I don't think that it is necessary to, to make that choice. Um, but one of the problems we are facing now is I think there's an emerging consensus um, that somehow uh, China does pose a long-term threat to Australia and therefore we need to build up our defence forces in order to deal with it, um, which creates this contradiction in sort of building up our defences against this um, imaginary threat, if you like, while at the same time working with China to build regional institutions and to socialize China into those um, regional institutions. And also being very dependent on China's resource needs Absolutely. for our yeah. trade. Yeah. But uh, this raises the question, what messages are we sending to China mm. when, for example, our Prime Minister uh, invites the US to expand its military presence here in mm -hmm. Australia. Is mm -hmm. that the right message to be sending to China or is this mm -hmm. part of the contradiction you're talking about? That, that's part of the contradiction and I think, um, you know, one of my greatest concerns is that we're not having a big, more of a debate about this. Um, and, you know, to use John Stuart Mill's term, we have the, the slumber of a decided opinion that suddenly this, this happens um, without us even realizing it. There's this buildup of, of a sense that, yes, China is this, is this threat. Um, and if you're sitting in, in Beijing, um, that does lead to the kind of security dilemmas that the analysts talk about, um, that that defensive posture will be seen as offensive from, from the Beijing perspective. Part of the difficulty we have here is that um, is, is the pace of the change, uh, because uh, uh, China and the rest of the region's uh, economic uh, transformation is just so rapid. The flow-on effects from it are also so rapid. Um, uh, and what, from their point of view, um, or from any given country's point of view, can be just uh, providing for one's own defence, can be uh, deeply unsettling uh, for others around you. Mm. And it's happening so quickly, we're all struggling uh, to process it. Well, it's even really happened faster than China expected it to, hasn't it? I mean, since becoming a member of the WTO and the, the growth just taking off so quickly. I mean, just the fact that, um, that uh, China, I just read the other day, has now become or overtaken the US as the biggest or second world biggest market in luxury items, for example, mm. I thought was rather extraordinary, just behind Japan. But uh, that in itself... Um, simple as it seems, would put a lot of Americans' noses out of joint, wouldn't it? 
No comment. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure it's in vogue at the moment in, in the United States to be buying luxury items, um, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. It's certainly not in vogue. Hugh, you've written about the dangers of um, rising Chinese power uh, in terms of whether or not uh, we should be giving room and conceding space or, or is that too dangerous? or uh, should we be, in fact, embracing these rapid changes? Yes, Virginia, I think it is a really critical question for Australia and, for that matter, for the rest of the region. Um, and it goes to many of the points that the panel, I think, have, have very well made. The fact is that as China's wealth grows, its strategic power grows in lots of different dimensions. Whether or not that ends up threatening Australia or threatening anybody else depends partly on what China decides and partly on what the rest of us decide, partly how we respond to China's growing power, how much space we give it. Um, and I think, um, you know, going to Cathy's point, uh, we do face some choices. We in Australia face some choices about how far we should be willing to change our vision of the way the region works to accommodate the fact that China's now got more power. In other words, how far we should be willing to accept that America is not going to be the dominant power in Asia as it has been for so long. <coughs> that would be different for us. It would be a bit more uncomfortable for us because America is so easy for us to get on with. Um, but if we do stick with China, if we do stick with the United States, if we do support the United States in refusing to give China any more space, we might be condemning ourselves to a much more hostile relationship with China than we otherwise would need to do. So that's a very delicate balance for Australia to strike. It's a very delicate balance for the region to strike. And I'd be interested in the panel's views on how far the differences in values between Western societies and China should count in that, how, sh how far it should affect our approach to that question. Indeed, and that's a great question for the panel, and how do we reconcile those differences too? Who would like to take that up? Veronica? Yeah, I'd like to recast uh, Hugh's uh, choice a little bit um, through the lens of law and regulation. So from the United States, we hear an incessant drumbeat of criticism about the lack of rule of law in China and the inadequacy of regulatory responses to food safety, to environmental uh, crises, to uh, social well-being of citizens, including their human rights. And those are all legitimate criticisms that Chinese citizens make about their own system as well. But there's an opportunity there as well as a, a threat for countries like Australia. The opportunity is to offer constructive regulatory solutions and to engage in a dialogue with China that sees the system for what it is. As Stephen points out, a system uh, existing within what's still essentially a, a poor country and one that still has a lot of development to uh, take place. The other thing that um, I think is, is very important uh, there is that uh, China offers enormous potential for experimentation. The regulatory um, approaches that are being taken in China are actually a public good. They're going to be relevant models for the rest of Asia. They may even be models that Australia and other uh, post-industrial countries can learn from. Uh, so the experimentation is, uh, is important and China itself is also a tremendous location for testing our policy initiatives and solutions in a vastly different location. So I'm a little more upbeat about uh, the choices that we have. Let me, uh, let, me, let me follow on. I mean, if we think about it in stark terms when societies face really stark, dramatic choices um, uh, of, of the sort that um, uh, he was... Uh, pushing us to confront, um, does one set oneself down a path that may lead to conflict and war? Um, I think values uh, are really important then. I, th I think they're really core things that um, whether one's uh, running a government or just a citizen, I think they're core things that, are, that people fall back on. But I also think it's really elusive and, and slippery and just what are our values and what are somebody else's values? And let, let me illustrate that. And in terms of um, regional relations, Vietnam, I, I would suggest, has got a different mix of values than, than this society in, in all sorts of ways. And yet the sorts of choices it faces in thinking about China aren't radically different. In some ways they're sharper because of geography. Um, South Korea, the Philippines, um, different values in all sorts of ways, 
and yet they face some similar choices. So that's why I say, I guess I'm speaking out both sides of my mouth. Uh, on, on the one hand, I think these are really fundamental, but I also think it's much less clear cut than um, uh, easy conversation often suggests. Can I just, uh, to put this in a, a stark sort of context that we can all um, make sense of, just on China, when we were speaking of values, just if we remind ourselves of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Pre Peace Prize winner who's currently in jail, serving 11 years, um, Liu Xiaobao, he wrote about universal values, and this is primarily what got him into trouble. And I'll just quote you, when he was speaking of those values of freedom, equality and human rights, and he suggested that democracy and constitutional government are the fundamental framework for protecting those values, values that he said are, are universal values. And yet, for that, the Chinese have imprisoned him. So doesn't that highlight this very difficult tension that we have? Well, I certainly think it does. And I, I think, you know, if you look at very long term, it's inevitable that uh, world you know, military strategic power will shift to Asia just by the tyranny of population. Right? But these are the biggest countries by far. And once they catch up, they're a long way from the capita income of the US. You know, you just, they're, they're going to dwarf uh, the US. So long term, that's going to be where, where the power goes. And, and whether it's a good or a bad thing, I think, really just hinges on what the point you've made, whether China makes that shift to a democratic system. Well, does that mean that, that China is going to become the new system maker? Uh, well, I think in the very long term, maybe not uh, in the next 10 years, but in the very long term, you have to think the most likely outcome is that the China catches up to the US in per capita income. They've got a long way to go. They're only about one-tenth now. They'll catch up, and then by population, they will be... Uh, the, they, they will be the vastly the biggest economy. And so I'm not saying they'll be the only superpower. They may not have the dominance the US has had, but they will certainly, I think, be the most powerful country. It's already a system shaper, one of the system shapers. Um, uh, I don't think anyone uh, in our imaginable future is going to be a system maker anymore. There's going to be a range of uh, uh, players out there that are in, uh, in a position to shape. But I think uh, we're, we're out of an era where there's any one or or to dominate things. Yeah, I think you could say China and India have already have veto power. And if you look at the WTO, you look at the climate change negotiations, you can see you can't get an agreement without those two countries. So there's shaping, but not making. Um, from what we have heard so far today, apparently uh, China and the United States are the mo two most important uh, powers in and beyond the Asian Pacific regions. Um, but I mean, despite their close economic relations, uh, there are still a lot of uh, fundamental disagreements uh, between these two countries. For example, uh, as some of our panelists has just mentioned, uh, on the one hand, China uh, considers uh, human rights, key back Taiwan issues as its own uh, in internal affairs. While on the other hand, the United States seems to often frame such issues as an international problem. So my question therefore are, um, how will these disagreements affect the Sino-US relations in the years ahead? And how will these um, disagreements affect the development of the Asian Pacific region in the future? Thank you. Terrific, thank you for that question. I'll throw that open to the panel. Perhaps start with you, Cathy. Yeah, um, thank you. That was, a, that was a very good question. Um, I think at the heart of, of that question is um, differences in, in sovereignty and, and what sovereignty means. Um, China has a very conservative, classical understanding of sovereignty in terms of the preservation of territorial integrity, um, monop monopoly over power, etc., from within. Um, whereas, of course, the, the US has, has, has a broader conception, uh, as well as many other liberal democratic states now, um, in terms of states being held accountable to alleged human rights violations from within, what we call the new sovereignty paradigm. Um, and at, at the moment, there's, there's little indication that, that China is moving um, systematically towards that new um, sovereignty paradigm, if you like. So there is a real disconnect there. In terms of your question on, on the internationalization of, of um, <coughs> territorial disputes, you're seeing that also in the South China Sea. Um, and this is, again, a principle that China holds uh, very fast, that, that you know, one cannot interfere in the affairs of what he, it considers 
um, to be its sovereign right. Um, but there is a problem there, because if you look at it, obviously South China Sea is an international um, of, of, of international concern. There are various states that lay claims to the South China Sea. Um, the issues there are, are global issues of, of energy, of, of fisheries, of um, uh, maritime security, etc. And, and even in Tibet um, is, is, is not simply a, of a domestic concern. It has an international flavor to it, not simply because the Dalai Lama internationalized this, this campaign, but also because um, there is a universal narrative, really, it's um, happening here in the case of Tibet. Because again, it's about uh, marginalized populations. It's about uh, struggles over resources, um, development concerns, and issues of self-determination that we see in other parts of the world, in other parts of Asia, not only within China. Kathy, can I just pick you up on, um, you mentioned the Dalai Lama, and this is particularly interesting to me. I hosted his event here in Canberra. Right. Why is it so important for the Prime Minister not to meet with the Dalai Lama? Is, is the message to China, is the sign language there so important that uh, she must take that position? I think, it, yeah, for, 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 for the Chinese government, it's, it's of great symbolic value um, that if you are going <coughs> to have a relationship and, and, and work with China, then you have to abide by the one China principle, um, and that relates to, to Taiwan and, and also issues in, in relation to, to Tibet. Um, and seeing the Dalai Lama um, is seen as an affront um, from the Chinese perspective and uh, a, a lack of respect, if you like, and most importantly, meddling in the internal affairs of the state and, and taking sides. The problem is that this is a highly polarized debate. Mm. Very, very difficult. I've, I've, I've tried it, actually, not on TV, but <laughs> without TV, um, to talk about Tibet. And um, I've been attacked from both sides. <laughs> it, it's very difficult to, to, to be balanced about it. And it, it always yeah. becomes a very difficult issue here in Canberra uh, right. with each time that uh, right. the Dalai Lama has come right. here. Thank you for, for being here today. My name is Paul Ashink. I'm a captain of the United States Army, a graduate student at the Australian National University. And this is a question I've thought a lot about since being here in Australia, I made the debate, as well as taking courses by Kathy Morton and you, Sir Andrew McIntyre, and that is the Australian-American alliance. How does Australia best balance between its expanding ties with China while also maintaining the alliance, the Australian-American alliance? I, I guess, in other words, what is Australia's China strategy? Oh, I don't think any of us would want to presume to speak yes. uh, on behalf of the government That's here. Right. I think... Uh, okay, well, that's right. Thank you. Think, think, think 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 what do you think it should be? Should be yeah. <laughs> Better question. Um, uh, so I think what Australia will do in broad terms uh, is what most other countries in the region are going to do <laughs> in broad terms. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Australia uh, is, in strategic terms, uh, concerned just because of the speed and the scale of China's transformation. It can't not be. Uh, Australia uh, will and should uh, look very hard to its alliance uh, with the United States uh, to make sure uh, that's well positioned uh, for the period we're heading into. And there's already signs that, of, of movement in Canberra on that. Um, but that's not all Australia will do. Uh, Australia will also uh, try um, uh, very hard uh, to develop the broadest based relationship uh, with China uh, that it possibly can. Uh, uh, and that won't just be about trade. It'll be about all sorts of other things. That's where institutions like universities are really important. Movements of people in all sorts of ways. Uh, Australia will and should, just the way I think most other countries in the region will and should, uh, do everything in their power uh, to avoid facing a pointy-edged question at the same time uh, as also preparing for the possibility that they might. Stephen, what are your thoughts on that? Should Australia <coughs> avoid a pointy-ended question? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I could see you were slipping uh, away into a chair there. So, yes. Shy away from uh, these military questions. I, 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 well, as a, as a non-specialist on these kind of strategic questions, we're obviously we're not going to walk away from the US and uh, China's our biggest trading partner, so 
we're going to straddle both sides for as long as we can, and there's not much we can do about it. I mean, we can make a few decisions, which should be debated, about defence spending, but largely we are going to be the passive recipient of, of what happens. And, uh, you know, a lot of what China's doing shouldn't be defended. You know, look at China's role in North Korea. You know, China is propping up that, that regime. Right? Look at China's role in Burma. So there's a lot that uh, China's doing that's, you know, needs to be criticised. Um, but that will, you know, China's foreign policy comes from its internal uh, politics. And so I go back to the key question for both these uh, international developments and for China's own future is whether it makes that transition, sooner or later, you'd think it will have to make the transition from a one-party state to a democracy. You know, when it makes that transition, whether it makes it peacefully, you know, whether it makes it smoothly. Okay. Cathy, may I come in there? Um, I, <clears throat> I think to, to, to answer your question, Paul, that um, a strategic hedging strategy is not the way to go. Um, going back to my early points about the mixed signals, I think that can so easily lead to strategic miscalculations. I mean, how, how can we genuinely, if, if our mission here in Australia, a shared mission by America and a shared mission in, in China to ensure that we have a safe and secure and prosperous regional future, how can we build, do that by building up arms and, and through the barrel of the gun? It's... It, 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 it's I can't see that happening. So I think a, uh, a more enlightened approach um, is, to, is for Australia to make sure that it puts all the effort and the resources, diplomatically, educationally, into public diplomacy, into engaging both these nations in our region um, on Areas in which still there are, there, are, there are not really strong institutions in terms of conflict prevention and conflict mediation, dealing with transnational threats, with climate change, with food and energy security, um, human trafficking, that's one area actually where, where Australia has been very active, um, dealing with real threats now that, that we are facing, I think is the way that we need to go. Question of clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so were you su uh, suggesting those mm -hmm. um, multiple strategies mm -hmm. as uh, something that we do in addition to investing in defen traditional defence type uh, um, priorities or as alternatives? Well, I think, I think one of the problems is that at the moment it, it's sort of set up as being we can do both. Um, in, in the sense that we're going to build up our, our, our defence um, as a hedge against a potential threat coming from China, it would seem. But at the same time, we're going to work to engage China in the region. So you're suggesting and we I can't think, do that? I, I, I don't think that that is a workable strategy. If <laughs> the mission is, is one of um, regional peace and stability. Going to the issue of climate change, um, as China booms and really expands um, economically, what's the prospect in terms of um, climate change action? Is it more likely to take after the United States in terms of limited action on climate change or possibly an Australian model or an Australian uh, view in, it in embracing a strong climate change action as in the recent uh, carbon tax legislation that we've had? Well, I, I mean, I think China is critical for climate change, absolutely uh, critical. And you can see it in the Australian debate. China gets used by both sides. Those who support action uh, point to the China being the biggest investor in renewable energy. Those who are opposed to this uh, carbon tax uh, point to the fact that emissions are still growing rapidly in China. There's still big uh, coal-fired expansion. And, and the, the fact is uh, both are true. So there are these contradictory tendencies uh, in, in China. But... So it's partly to do with the complexity of China, but it's also to do with our expectations. And it, I go back to this point I made before. We're not used to seeing a poor country being a powerful country. And so they give rise to different expectations. <laughs> so from the point of view of China being powerful, we say, well, it's the, it's the world's largest emitter. Its emissions are growing rapidly. It, it must act. In fact, it must lead. Unless it acts, you know, we're not going to. But from the point of view of it being a, a, a poor country, you know, its emissions are just a fraction of Australia's emissions per capita, right, which is how you measure wealth. Uh, per capita, its, its emissions are uh, about a third or a quarter of Australia's. Uh, it's, a very, it's got a lot of other priorities. It hasn't got that historical responsibility. So from that point of view, it's looking to the rest of the world uh, to take a lead. And so 
uh, <clears throat> beyond the deb immediate debate in Australia, you know, what we need to do is, is resolve, reconcile those expectations, find somewhere uh, in the middle. But if we want China to act, you know, it is totally the wrong approach to say, well, we'll, we'll follow China. Because that is the guarantee not to work. You know, if, if we want China to do more, and we need China to do more, uh, we have to we have to expect China uh, we we have to expect China to follow our example, not not lead us. Mm. Kathy, I was going to say that there are some areas where we should be following China. I think on climate change, um, and and we have a lot to learn. Um, some of their policies on clean energy by over the next decade, the Chinese government is investing something like seven eighty eighty billion uh, U.S. dollars in in, in clean energy. Um, and there are many new policies, many innovative policies now that the government's been um, <coughs> carrying out that, that um, also could be emulated in other parts of the world. So it's not just a one-way street. I think there's, there's going to need to be much more uh, exchange, if you like, with China. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and this comes at a time when we've just heard that, of course, uh, South Korea has taken a position or some strong, a strong position on um, carbon emissions, and in fact... Korea has been pushing very hard um, the idea of green growth <coughs> and the East Asian low carbon development path. Do you think that's got legs? Uh, well, green growth is the, uh, if there is a future, it's green growth. Yes, it's not climate change itself. And it goes back to the point Andy made. There's a, there's a sort of network or complex of issues that these countries are concerned about. They are all energy importers. So they are worried about energy security. They have massive local pollution. You know, I think you know, most of the world's most polluted cities are in, are in China. Uh, so they are concerned about all of these issues as well as climate change, and that's that is comes under this package of uh, of green growth, and uh, they are certainly taking action, as Cathy said. But you know we have to acknowledge also it's uh, you know China is very capital intensive on a very capital intensive energy intensive growth path. China's you know probably the only country that's trying to lower its growth, right? Not just for to stop overheating, but as a structural shift to permanently lower its growth to reduce the damage to the environment. But it doesn't know how to do that. Right? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very uncertain situation at the moment. And if we want to encourage China to do more, you know, we, we need to get more out in front. We can't lead from behind. Thailand now with the new, um, well, with the election of Yin Luck, we can hope only that the, the past um, five years or so of uh, disunity there will settle. What's your, well, what are your thoughts about the broader regional stability at this stage? Thanks, Virginia. There was a time when Australians looking out into Southeast Asia would have considered Thailand to be the number one beacon of stability and tranquility. It was the democratic leading light in that part of the world. And at least from Australia's perspective, we got to know Thailand as, as a place of perhaps bars, beaches and bargains or some such. And that combination has meant that Australia and Thailand have developed a, a very nifty relationship uh, dynamic in all kinds of ways. Thailand, as you suggested, has gone through this particularly messy period, though, and it's a period that comes right at the end of the current king's reign. He, he's been on the throne for 65 years now, and Thailand, since the coup of September 2006, has really struggled to work out a new consensus around its institutions. All of this now plays into how we see the rest of the Southeast Asian region. Uh, Indonesia, perhaps, has replaced Thailand as that shining light uh, as we gaze out to our uh, northern neighbours. But Thailand still has the potential to perhaps get itself back on a path uh, where it will be considered once again uh, to be the kind of country that everyone else in Southeast Asia, hoping to, to graduate from a, a semi-democratic status to perhaps a, a full democratic status, will be looking to emulate. So are you optimistic about uh, political stability in that area? I'm optimistic about the prospects of a number of the Southeast Asian neighbours that Australia has, but Thailand, precisely because so much of its current situation is uh, unresolvable at the end of the current king's reign, should be a country of concern to Australia and to Australians. We should be doing our best to encourage Thais and others in Southeast Asia who are confronting these very, very messy transitions to be looking for friendship uh, in their neighbourhood and beyond it. And Australia can certainly be playing a role there to, to hopefully, in the long run, um, allow the Thais and other Southeast Asians who are struggling right now uh, to really pull themselves in directions 
which will, in the very long term, we hope, be in their best interest. Nick, I, I want to ask you also um, about Burma. I know you have a particular interest in Burma as well. What's your view on what Australia's position with Burma should be? Australia currently maintains a very modest set of sanctions against the Burmese government. Uh, in my estimation, those sanctions are limited and symbolic. They are token in so many different ways. But because we have a debate about Burma in Australia, which is almost entirely focused on those sanctions, we, we miss the fact that Burma is in its own way struggling out of so many decades of military dictatorship. Australia will never be in a position to have any direct impact on Burma's domestic politics. But perhaps what we could do for the betterment of Burma and perhaps for our own um, good conscience is to really do our best to engage with those elements of Burma in society who are trying their hardest to try and move out of this long period of darkness into whatever follows. Our debates about sanctions, though, don't help that one iota. Mm, mm. I think it's also very important, you know, to have that in our mind because it's very easy to get carried away. And I, I do it myself, you know, the Asian century, the rise of Asia, and you start thinking, well, it's all inevitable, it's all going to happen. But I mean, Thailand's an example of how things can go, can go wrong. I think Japan is an example of how countries can get stuck. Uh, Pakistan, you know, in the 60s, 70s, right through to the 80s, mm. Pakistan was seen as much more successful than India. And now look at Pakistan. You know, we, it's our graduation week, and when you say goodbye to students from Pakistan, you really feel... I mean, not to offend anyone who's going back to Pakistan, but you feel sorry that they have to go back there. It's such an unstable country. So, and you feel anxious for them. Yeah, yeah anxious, exactly. And, and they do too. So there is nothing uh, inevitable about the, about the rise of Asia. That's mm. for sure. Veronica, we passed lightly over Japan there, and I just mm. want to uh, refocus us on Japan because it is very tempting to say, well, look, Japan is stalled. They missed the reform bus. The economy's frozen. It's pretty much all over for the world's third largest economy. And I think that completely undersells Japan. Um, one of the things that um, is going to happen in the future is that economies within Asia will slow down. And the Vietnam that wants to grow rapidly today will eventually be an ageing, slow-growth economy. And what Japan really stands for is a very interesting model of how to slow down gracefully and maintain social equality, do equity to, to citizens, and uh, really confront very, very complex issues, the same issues of uh, environmental uh, degradation, uh, nuclear risk, um, complex ageing society, and do it all on a much, much tighter budget. So I'd caution us to, uh, to not disengage from Japan too rapidly because it really is an important model for the region. I'm sure the Japanese would be very happy to hear you say that it's, it's a matter of slowing down gracefully. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely way of putting it. <laughs> I've never heard stagnation uh, described quite like that. But look, I, I think that um, we're going to have to wrap up, but I would like to ask each of the panellists, just in summary, to give us a sense of your optimism or pessimism uh, whichever it might be, in regard to uh, Australia's place when we look at the growing, burgeoning Asian region around us. Um, are you optimistic, cautious, or a little pessimistic? We'll start with you, Andrew. Uh, I'm optimistic. Um, uh, I think Australia's got a number of uh, uh, terrific endowments, uh, economically, culturally, socially, our institutions. Um, I think the generation of Australians that are running uh, the, the country in the broadest sense uh, at the moment, uh, by world standards, very well equipped. What I worry about is the next generation. These people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surely not. No, and he, he, here's why I say that. Um, uh, the generation that's running the country, again, in the broadest sense, I don't just mean... You're not talking about politics. I'm not just talking politics at all. Community leaders, mm -hmm. the whole lot. Uh, came through uh, uh, an era when uh, uh, this country made big investments in what we loosely call Asian literacy. And it's declined dramatically. Um, uh, and forget about the universities, the place to look is the high schools. The place to look is the high schools, and it's the number of students that are getting uh, Asian languages in school I mean, if current trends for a report done just, just last year, if current trends continue 
In five years, there will be no students in year 12 studying Indonesian. That is staggering. Right now, um, this was a, two years ago, this report, um, there were 300 Australian, even Chinese, even Chinese, 300 Australians learning Chinese that did not have a Chinese family background. Um, even more troubling, if you, if you take literacy to mean not just language, if you look at what goes on, for example, in modern history classes, Year 12, the people that do history uh, in the final exams, only 2% opted to do Asian content. Something like 56% uh, opted, opted to do German content, you can understand that. 16 or so percent opted for Russian content. 2%? That's what I mean, I, I worry about the next generation, not because of who the next generation is, but what <laughs> Ended up being is that a, a failure to understand the importance or the opportunity or a, a lack of encouragement? I, I think it's a mix of things. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, and not just Australia, many of us have in some ways taken wrong messages out of globalisation. Many of us have sort of thought it's all one big beige thing and we're all out there and the language is probably English. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and we can all just get by. We can all just get by. And at some level, that's true. But it's not true for deep insight, for close connection, for nuanced understanding. Um, uh, and in investment has just gone down in this. And uh, you know, so partly that's a political thing over, over many years. Um, but also, no doubt, uh, educational institutions need to take a hard look at themselves as well. Okay, all right. Cathy, optimistic, pessimistic, cautious? A little bit of both. Um, uh, optimistic because um, I, I left England to, to come to Australia precisely because I thought this is the country that has critical mass um, when it comes to research and education on, on the Asia Pacific. I, I think it still does. Um, and when I talk to colleagues in, in Washington or London or other European capitals, they're deeply envious of what we've got. Um, so let's, let's value it and appreciate it. But I think, again, um, running off from Andrew's point, that importance of investing in the future. Um, and I definitely applaud the idea of literacy. I also think it's important for the future generation to have those opportunities of experience. Um, I know that there's a Chinese saying that you have to read a thousand books and walk a thousand li. Um, and I know that I wouldn't know half of what I do about China if I hadn't spent so much time there and had the opportunities and the scholarships to be able to do that um, because that's where the real learning takes place and that's where you're really confronted um, with your own worldviews and own expectations. Mm. And that's how I think we advance. Okay. Stephen, optimistic, pessimistic? I'd say overall uh, moderately optimistic, <laughs> but uh, to respond uh, to the point Andrew made on that particular note of Asian literacy, I'm less negative than he is. He, I'm not denying you know, the facts that he cited, but if you look at it more broadly, uh, you know there are a number of other trends I think going the other direction. So uh, the first is you know we've got a lot of Asians migrating to Australia. So I think if you take out the New Zealanders, about half of migrants to Australia come from Asia. <laughs> So we've got that strong link. Uh, all our uh, international students, I mean, they nearly all come from Asia. They go back, but they provide a very strong link. And then uh, so many Australians travel, so many more Australians travel these days, and they often travel uh, to and through Asia. So apart from the dynamic university students we see here, and no doubt there aren't enough, which is, which is Andrew's point, uh, I think... Uh, you know, we're the. I'm not. I'm not as worried about Asia literacy. I think we're more engaged with Asia than we ever have been. Okay, Veronica. I uh, share that optimism, uh, but I also think that Asia is not going to wait for Australia, mm. and there are gaps in our knowledge, particularly in relation to uh, Islamic Asia, particularly in relation to the smaller countries. We've talked a lot about China today, but Asia is much more than China, and uh, we need to address those. It's not a one-time only investment. 
and uh, the investment that we made collectively in the 1980s and 1990s needs uh, to be revisited. Uh, there's a long lead time for truly uh, becoming uh, literate, for truly mastering uh, languages that are complex. And one thing is absolutely certain, and that is that the challenges being faced within Asia, which affect us deeply, are becoming more and more complex. So the knowledge that served us well and the expertise that Cathy was talking about, which really has been a hallmark of uh, Australian intellectual and political life, may not be enough into the future. Okay, thank you for that. And the investment that you talk about, of course, this college here, uh, the College of Asia and the Pacific here at the ANU is an example of that investment and its predecessors that uh, came about after the Second World War. But what I'm hearing today is that uh, there is great need for further and deeper investment in Australia's Asian literacy. I thank you very much indeed. Veronica, Stephen, Cathy and Andrew, thank you for your time today. <laughs>